Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. For countless parents, the journey to unschooling has redefined childhood and transformed their family relationships. Are you curious? Together, let's explore what living and learning looks like without school. Hello, explorers. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 301 of the podcast. It's the 27th of October, 2021, as I record this intro. And this week, I'm continuing my mini-series in celebration of unschooling, sharing the draft of an as-yet unpublished book I wrote a few years ago. The book looks at unschooling through the lens of parenting, and last week I shared Chapter 3, Nurturing Curiosity. So this week, we're driving into Chapter 4, The Joy of Learning. I don't think I've mentioned, but each week I'm sharing highlights of the episode on Instagram. I'm really enjoying creating slides to highlight the story of the chapter. I'm Pam Larickia there, no spaces, and I'll also put a link in the show notes. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the chapters there, or you can comment on the show notes page. Of course, before we dive in, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has chosen to support the podcast through Patreon. And a big welcome to new patron, Elena Hinova. Hi, Elena. I deeply appreciate all my patrons. Your generous support pays for the hosting and the transcription and contributes to the time I spend creating new episodes each week. It's instrumental in keeping the podcast archive freely available to anyone who's curious and wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. If you'd like to join my community of patrons and scoop up some great rewards along the way, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And now, let's dive back into the book. Chapter 4, The Joy of Learning How many children and teens do you know who joyfully go off to school to learn each day? Did you? How often have you heard going to school being described as a child's job? Every day, many adults and children trudge off to work and school, both looking forward to their next vacation. The evidence around us, our own experience, the children in our lives and in our neighborhood, not to mention in TV and movies, seems conclusive. Children must be told to learn. Children don't want to learn and will do whatever they can to avoid it. But is that human nature or is it the result of their learning environment? Because unschooling parents see a completely different picture. Without school, their children and teens enjoy learning. Even when it's challenging, they rarely shy away from it. It's fun. And they don't take vacations from learning. They are learning all the time. How can that be? Children learn to dislike learning. Year after year, new unschooling parents discover that children don't resist learning. They resist being told what to learn. As parents begin to view life through the lens of learning rather than school, they come to see that children and teens, like babies and toddlers, are instinctively motivated to make sense of the world around them, to learn. To sort through this seeming paradox, let's look at two of the fundamental differences between the conventional and unschooling perspectives on learning. The first difference is in how they define learning content. Unschooling sees all learning as having value. If a child is interested in something, there is value in learning about it. In contrast, the education system, through its laser focused on curricula, gives those academic subjects and skills an arbitrary importance over everything else. Any activities or learning children do outside of school are described as extracurricular, outside of the curriculum and are therefore less important. It's not surprising then that since important learning only takes place in school and in school we see children actively avoiding learning, the prevailing wisdom is that children don't want to learn. But why are many school children trying so obviously to avoid learning? Mostly because in school, learning is boring and hard. Boring because they are rarely interested in the curriculum and hard because it is hard to focus on something they're not interested in. 
Much of what they are expected to learn isn't interesting because it's not applicable to their lives, so it makes little sense in their world. That disconnection from real life is a big reason why curriculum-driven learning can be so challenging for both teachers and students. It makes it hard for teachers to create an engaging learning environment, and without that active connection, there's little for students to anchor their new learning to. Why do I have to learn this? Asking a disinterested child to learn the water cycle is like asking a disinterested adult to learn the radioactive decay chain of uranium-238. <laughs> it is harder to learn things when you are not interested in them. With unschooling, not only does personal interest spur the intrinsic motivation to push through the challenging moments of figuring something out, it brings the child's existing related knowledge bubbling to the surface so they can connect new information to it, expanding their understanding. Without that personal interest, their mind has to work harder to find a connection for this random piece of information to make sense in their world. Often, they'll instead take the shortcut of just memorizing the information rather than processing and understanding it. They know they only need to keep it in memory until the test is over. The corollary to important learning takes place in school is that the learning they do outside of school is not important. The things they seem to learn easily because they are interested in them aren't even considered real learning. How can you remember the names of all the Pokemon, but you can't remember how to spell the words on your spelling list? This curriculum-restricted definition of learning perpetuates the belief that learning is hard work. But what they are more correctly experiencing is that school learning is hard work. The second difference between the conventional and unschooling perspectives on learning is in how they approach the learning process. Unschooling fosters the child's intrinsic motivation to learn by focusing on the child's interests and goals. In contrast, schools are left to rely heavily on external motivation, stickers for completed worksheets, charts to track student behavior with privileges gained and lost accordingly, and grades on tests and report cards. This is the inevitable result of needing everyone to follow a predetermined curriculum. The content itself isn't particularly interesting to most students, so they need to find other ways to encourage them to pay attention and learn. But might these external rewards actually be undermining the learning they are attempting to encourage? The system has done a great job of getting parents and children to value external rewards such as grades. The problem is that their external nature takes a focus off the learning itself. Let's imagine for a moment we're back in high school and there's a biology test coming up. What's one of the first things we asked the teacher? If your class was anything like mine, it was, what's on the test? And what did we study? Just what was going to be on the test. Why? Because the goal wasn't to learn biology, it was to get a good grade. Or maybe you were actually interested in biology. Maybe you heard something like this. You did so well on your biology test. See, you're smart. You could get better grades in your other subjects if you just applied yourself. If you believed that, you felt bad about yourself. Yet the reality is you can't force yourself to be interested in other subjects. And we're back to external motivation. With the focus on grades, not only do students focus solely on what's going to be on the test, if they don't understand something while they're studying, they're much more apt to memorize it rather than trying to figure it out. And that is reasonable. It's the quickest way to their goal. They're smart. If the goal is good grades and the process to get there is to get high marks on the tests, then the most efficient way to do that is to focus on what's on the test and memorize it as quickly as possible. It's so much more effort to understand all the course content in all their courses to make sense of it and connect it to what they already know. And that extra effort goes unrewarded. So for most students, it soon falls off their radar. And that's not to criticize students or teachers at all. It is precisely the behavior that the system cultivates. Even when these kinds of extrinsic motivators work, they actually undermine the learning they were originally attempting to encourage. The emphasis on grades means that a student's goal soon becomes to get a good mark, not to learn. 
any interest they may have had in learning and mastering a subject is lost in the chase for good grades. These two aspects, how learning is defined and approached, converge in the education system to create an environment in which many children actively learn to avoid and dislike learning. Through the design of the education system, we have created an environment where learning is boring and hard. Then we restricted our definition of learning to learning done in school, with everything else devalued as extracurricular. Through their school experience, children internalize the belief that learning is hard and boring, so they begin to avoid it. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy. The behavior we are observing is not innate. We have created it. Children's resistance to learning is a result of the environment in which we insist they learn. School. And that message that real learning only happens at school is powerful. I remember my daughter at 14 telling me the story of how one of the girls leading some badge work at Pathfinders had asked her, since you don't do tests, do you know how to study? Trying to politely point out the absurdity of the question, she replied, do you mean, do I know how to read and remember what I read? The girl didn't understand how that answered her question. That's how disconnected school and life can easily get. Children aren't born disliking learning. They learn to dislike learning by being immersed in the conventional learning environment of curriculum, testing, and grading. That perspective is further supported by what we see with children who don't go to school. With unschooling, how learning is defined and approached resonates to create an environment where children actively pursue and enjoy learning. Let's explore what that looks like. The flow of learning. Take a moment to think about your own learning experiences in and out of school. Think about those times when your learning stuck, meaning you understood it and remembered it later. When it made sense and expanded your view of how the world works. Think about those times when you enjoyed learning, those times when you were so engaged in the activity you hardly noticed that you were learning in leaps and bounds. In my experience, this genuine and satisfying learning is found when a person is deeply engaged in an activity that skirts the edges of their knowledge and skills. That feeling is often described as being in the flow. It's where competency and challenge dance. It's work and it's fun. Those aren't mutually exclusive. Unschooling is all about creating a learning environment that allows our children to regularly experience flow, which Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, author of Finding Flow, describes as the joy of complete engagement. He goes on to explain, when goals are clear, feedback relevant, and challenges and skills are in balance, attention becomes ordered and fully invested. Because of the total demand on psychic energy, a person in flow is completely focused. There is no space in consciousness for distracting thoughts, irrelevant feelings. Self-consciousness disappears, yet one feels stronger than usual. The sense of time is distorted. Hours seem to pass by in minutes. The disappearance of self-consciousness is a key aspect of being in the flow. When we drop that layer of internal analysis, that real-time judgment of ourselves and how we are performing, we hit a deeper level of engagement. We feel freer to experiment, to think outside the box, to ask dumb questions, those questions that are on the tip of our tongue, whose answers will bring us the greatest clarity in the moment. To get to that space, a child needs to feel safe. Csikszentmihalyi writes, the family seems to act as a protective environment where a child can experiment in relative security without having to be self-conscious and worry about being defensive or competitive. This is another way in which unschooling shines. Unschooling parents are focused on creating an emotionally safe environment for their children's exploration and learning. We've talked about how following their curiosity defines learning content that aligns with their day-to-day -day goals and actively engages them intellectually. Now we're looking at the other crucial piece of the learning puzzle, an emotionally safe environment where they can sink into complete engagement with their activity where they feel secure enough to explore their growing skills, to challenge themselves without fear of judgment or ridicule. 
As they try different things, feedback is immediate and incorporated into their next action. In that flow, they are focused on pursuing their goal, so much so that their learning, though deep and real, is practically incidental. And that's an important point. Learning itself isn't the goal. It's the byproduct of pursuing a real-life goal, which meshes well with Kaufman's definition of intelligence as the dynamic interplay of engagement and abilities in pursuit of personal goals that we talked about in the introduction. In Louder Than Words, Todd Henry describes why this personal connection is so important for long-term learning. This is corroborated by research into the science of memory making. People tend to remember important events long after they've passed, but not all events find equal footing. What matters most in forming long-term memories is the personal meaning that we ascribe to the events, and thus how intertwined they are with our sense of identity, desire, and purpose, and not simply what transpires. Regardless of how memorable an event might seem at the time, if there is no personal hook involved to help us assimilate the memory, then we are likely to forget it over time. It's that personal hook of pursuing things that are interesting to them that not only helps unschooling children get into the flow of their activity more often, it also helps them better remember the experience because it is woven together with their personal desires and goals. The deep flow, sorry, the deep engagement of flow is especially challenging for a teacher to cultivate in a classroom environment. Not only is it hard to help a child feel safe enough to explore freely in a room full of relative strangers, that sweet spot of almost inescapable learning will be different for each child based on their own unique combination of both their current knowledge and skills and their interests and curiosity. As Csikszentmihalyi describes it, a person's interest and motivation are key for creating a superlative learning environment. He writes, Usually, the more difficult a mental task, the harder it is to concentrate on it. But when a person likes what he does and is motivated to do it, focusing the mind becomes effortless, even when the objective difficulties are great. In essence, the freedom to choose their activity is key for creating flow. The intrinsic motivation key to staying engaged with an activity, even when things become challenging. Think about your own learning. Has that been your experience? In those situations where you experienced flow, where you were deeply engaged in an activity and learning seemed almost effortless, did you choose the activity? Were you interested in it? That's been my experience. Concentration and focus, and hence learning, is definitely more difficult when I'm not interested in the topic at hand. Freedom of choice is so important to creating an effective learning environment, yet it plays a minimal role in the compulsory school system. Free to choose how they spend their time, unschooling children actively pursue their interests and goals. In other words, they play. They learn both how to gather the information they want and how to process that information and incorporate it into their growing knowledge base. Do they prefer reading? books, websites, forums, magazines, listening to audiobooks or podcasts, watching videos, hands-on tinkering to figure out how things work, engaging with others who share similar interests. They gain a lot of experience through exploring the myriad of ways there are to learn. Over the years, they become experienced with critical thinking and making choices as they figure out how the more effective ways to pursue their interests. They gain experience with exploring their goals and brainstorming different ways to achieve them, understanding their likes and dislikes and competencies so they can choose learning environments that better mesh with their strengths, adjusting their path in response to new information or obstacles, and quitting things when their goals or circumstances change, which is an integral part of the learning process, not a character flaw. As they get older, their goals get correspondingly larger and longer term. They figure out when to push themselves and when to be patient. They explore ways to respond to disappointment. They don't internalize the message that learning is hard. They come to intimately understand how they learn most effectively and seek out those environments. That's very different from the school system's insistence that children change to fit into their learning process. 
Children whose most effective learning process differs from that of the classroom are definitely at a disadvantage and are often left feeling unintelligent. The child is blamed, not the system. As a result, they feel inferior, yet they are left to rely on that same teacher-student classroom paradigm into adulthood, no matter how ineffective it is for them, because that's all they know. Understanding how to learn gives unschoolers real control over their lives. As adults, when they want to learn something new, they jump in and get started, rather than waiting for the next continuing education course to start. They immerse themselves in new information in whatever formats they prefer. They find mentors, discovering where people with the knowledge and experience they are interested in gather, either online or in person, or both. Even when they choose a classroom setting, they don't hand control or judgment of their learning over to the teacher. Marks aren't the goal the learning is. And they pursue it with determination, moving closer to their goals and expanding their understanding of the world. As for testing, we don't have a family of 30 children and a boss to whom we have to prove we are doing our job. We are actively involved in our children's lives and we see them using their new knowledge and skills. We see them coming up with ideas, testing them out and tweaking them until they have a solid grasp of how things work. Invariably, at some point, they'll say or do something and we'll be surprised and ask them where they learned that. And over time, we'll look back and see how their knowledge and skills have grown, their activities morphed, and we'll see the threads that weave through them all. We will more deeply understand our children. However, the unique nature of real and effective learning means that it's not easy to control or predict. And this lies at the root of one of the biggest challenges for unschooling parents, giving learning the time and space it needs to proceed at the child's pace. We understand the value of the learner being in control of their learning, but sometimes that can get scary. How do we deal with the fear that occasionally crops up, especially when things seem to be moving slowly? The importance of patience. In school, one of the big challenges that teachers face is that there is really only one pace at which they can move their class, the one defined by the curriculum they have to cover in the days allotted to them by the school calendar. Unfortunately, that average speed will only mesh with a handful of students at any given time. And not only that, the, handful, the students in that handful will vary according to subject. So more often than not, when you look at things from the perspective of each individual student, the pace of the class is either too fast or too slow. In reality, learning is messy. Sometimes it happens quickly, learning connections flowing like falling dominoes, one after another after another. Other times, perseverance is the name of the game as some challenge thwarts their progress. Sometimes there's a lot of talking, questions and answers and theories. Other times, intense concentration demands silence. Teachers can teach and teach until the bell rings, but if the child isn't making the connection, they aren't learning. <clears throat> but outside the classroom? If our child is diving deep and fast into something, we can support them. If they are feeling stumped and frustrated by a challenge, we can support them. No matter the circumstances, children who are free to learn at their own pace, in their own style, actively learn. But still, we can find ourselves out of step with our children. Over the years, I discovered that challenging moments went more smoothly when I was able to find the patience to allow my child's learning to unfold at their pace even when it's messy or inconvenient or slower than I expected. Patience, when the kitchen table is taken up by the Monopoly board and your children have vowed that this will be their longest game ever. Patience, when your family is enjoying a crisp fall walk in the park and your youngest is stopping to examine each fallen leaf on the path. Patience, when you are waiting to go home and your teen is deeply engaged in conversation with their friends. It's not about being patient in a passive zone out until they're done kind of way, but about realizing that you're actively giving the process of unschooling time and space to unfold. 
Moments like the examples above aren't often big, splashy ones, but they add up over time. When I take the time to look for the learning or the self-care that is invariably woven into my children's activities, it helps me more clearly see these moments through their eyes. Why are they making those choices? As I explore that question, I begin to really see their process, to see unschooling in action. I see how curious they are about making the Monopoly game last. Taking a beat, I realize they'll discover how the game's strategies change when all the properties have been purchased, the streets completed, and hotels built. So as dinner time approaches, maybe I suggest a dish up and eat in the family room kind of dinner, or I offer to carefully move the game onto the living room table. Sometimes our children are the most amazing examples for slowing down and really seeing what's around us. Stop and smell the roses, or at least join them in wonder as they examine the fallen leaves. Which ones catch their attention the longest? Do they seem attracted by color? shape? Maybe I can bring more of that into their world at home too. And friends, just imagine how important their conversations may be, not necessarily from your vantage point, but from theirs. Maybe they are sorting out plans or processing emotions from a recent disagreement or sharing perspectives on a well-loved topic. Maybe they are supporting a friend after a hard day with some relaxing banter. Even then, it's not so much about the topic, but more about creating and strengthening their connections with other people. That is living and learning in action. Again, when I understand my child's perspective, when I see the moment through their eyes, I'm much more willing to recognize that this is the time that unschooling takes. To remember why I don't expect them to live and learn on my timetable to be patient and give them the time to stay engaged in their activity as long as they want, to sink into the flow of their learning. Now, let's take it a step further. We're being patient, giving our child time to let their learning unfold at their pace. We're in the room or wherever, noticing what our child is doing or attempting to do, and suddenly a thought bubbles up. They're doing it wrong. (laughs) Our instinct is to jump in and show them the, quote, right way to do it. But wait, (laughs) take a moment, be patient. Give your child some space to try to figure things out. The goal of long-term learning versus short-term memorizing isn't to be, quote, right, right out of the gate. It's to make sense of the thing in the context of what they're trying to do, to build learning connections. Remember Popova's counsel about making sense of the world. We're helping our children build wisdom, not a pool of information. One of the bigger lessons I learned through unschooling is that my way of doing things isn't necessarily the only way to do those things. Who knew? (laughs) In fact, though my way may be the most efficient or effective way for me, that doesn't mean it's the best way for others. That makes sense, doesn't it? but it can be surprisingly hard to put into action. Every fall, my husband invariably hints to me the right way to build a fire in our wood stove, even though my fires burn just as bright and warm. Packing the dishwasher, tying a knot, building a block tower, adding the Monopoly dice together. Through watching our children in action, unschooling parents are reminded that so often there's more than one way to do things. Our way may work well for us, but chances are there are many other creative ways that our children will come up with to solve the problem at hand. Soon, we are profoundly struck with the idea that different doesn't mean wrong. So many great ideas blossomed over the years because I managed to wait a bit. And it was being patient and allowing my children's learning to unfold at its own pace that gave me this gift of perspective. Along those lines, another thing I noticed was that when I wasn't quick enough to catch myself before jumping in and pointing out the answer, in those moments, their learning wasn't as strong. That's because when we jump in and direct their learning, the information we provide doesn't always connect as strongly to their existing understanding of the world. Think of it this way. They are following their learning connections A to B to C, and they pause for a moment, stretching for D. 
But because we can see where they're going and want to help, we jump in and point out E. It's premature, though, leaving them connecting C to E, which stretches the learning connection, making it thinner and more tenuous, their understanding of the whole not quite as solid. Yet, this is not to say that patience is about being uninvolved. The key is to follow their lead, to help when they want our help. How can I help? Or would you like my help? Are great questions to ask children, and adults for that matter, people, when they seem stuck. If they want our help, it's likely that their thoughts are sitting right there at D, ready to make that connection to E, and our information actually helps them continue on their path. At the heart of it, being patient is about remembering to pause and ask yourself, why not? Sometimes there is a solid reason to step in, but often there really is time to let things continue to flow as they are. By regularly choosing patience and taking the time to see how things play out, you will steadily build trust in both unschooling, because you'll see them learning, and in your children, because you'll see their choices working out, even when they are different from yours, which helps you reach for patience more easily the next time and the next. Their choices in each moment are the accumulation of the moments before, swirling together with where they are looking to go and the clearest picture of all that is in their mind. Support their exploration as much as you can by giving them the space and time to play and learn at their own pace, because that is where solid learning lives, not to mention the development of strong and trusting relationships. Passions are a window to the world. So we're letting learning flow in the style that works well for our child and being patient with their pace. Things go pretty smoothly for a while as we learn more about unschooling and watch it play out beautifully right in front of us. For some children, their engagement with their interests seems to know no bounds. Weeks and months pass and they just keep going deeper and deeper. More worry starts to creep in. Is this intense, passionate engagement in just one interest a good thing? Aren't they missing out on the rest of the world? Don't they need to broaden their horizons? We likely grew up steeped in the conventional education system's determination to teach students a wide base of general knowledge and skills. The idea is to keep all the doors open so a student can eventually choose any career path. And within the goals and parameters of school, that makes sense. They need to serve all students and thus support all possible learning paths. But again, their focus is on everyone, not the individual student. We've seen how solid learning happens when children are deeply engaged in their activity and that those circumstances arise more frequently when the child is actively pursuing things they find interesting. Interests typically flow in and out of their lives over time, some becoming passionate interests that catch their attention almost exclusively for weeks, months, or even years, while others are fleeting or soon morph into something related. Many unschooling families see a preference for immersion in an interest or topic, even for things that turn out to be passing interests. A few hours or days being enough to satisfy their curiosity before moving on. But for the parents of children whose intrinsic motivation drives them to focus on one particular topic for an extended period of time, it can become uncomfortable. They start to worry that their child is missing out, that they won't learn other important things. And when we're anxious, much of the fear-based conventional rhetoric bubbles up in our minds because it's been ingrained so deeply. Yet, in my experience, a passion does not narrow a child's learning. It turns out that a passion can be a wonderful window to the world. The skills for participating in society shine through per the pursuit of any interest or passion. <clears throat> As a child explores a deeply held interest over the years, they will want to read about it, to write about it, to talk to others about it. In other words, they will learn how to communicate. In their fascination, they will encounter logic, patterns, and critical thinking as they find and sort information. 
there will likely be a numeric slant, whether it be batting averages, word counts, hit points, or save percentages. These useful skills are applicable everywhere. Reading, writing, and numeracy are basic skills precisely because they permeate all aspects of our lives. <clears throat> and beyond those skills, as unschooling children explore their passions, they come in contact with so many different aspects of the world. Topics aren't as isolated as school subjects imply. Areas of interest will have a history, a geographical spread, a scientific angle, and especially for those passionately involved, a philosophical bent. Imagined graphically, the knowledge we've built as humans resembles an interconnected web much more than the railroad track of grades 1 through 12. Unschooling learning, with its freedom to follow the child's curiosity, mimics that web, following their thoughts and creating connections this way and that, building a more realistic understanding of the world. In my case, I became concerned about my eldest son's passion for video games. <clears throat> but after sitting in fear for a bit, I chose to be a bit more patient with both of us and to dig more deeply into what was going on. Over the next few months, I paid extra attention and noticed the many places that his gaming actually took him. Reading, walkthroughs and game guides, FAQs, message boards, story analysis, plot, character climax, atmosphere, reviews, fan fiction. Writing, typing, message boards, game outlines, character sketches. Research skills, web search tools, finding and evaluating sources, ways to learn things. Math skills. Percentages, logic, mazes, maps, money, time, data management and analysis, character, health levels, parameters, attributes, classes, and subclasses, self-awareness, decision analysis, self-concept, self-confidence, dealing with frustration, perseverance, game and story development, cheat codes, programming, HTML, backstory, character development, languages, mythology, and culture. I was amazed. So much so that I tried it with my daughter's fascination with Harry Potter at the time and found a similar pattern of learning and skills development that spanned reading, writing, research, online tools, languages, mythology, and culture. I learned that their passions, rather than closing them off, actively engaged them with so much of the world. It can sometimes help to envision that something they are so passionate about may develop into a career as they get older, and that is a possibility. Yet, even if it forever remains an enjoyable hobby, following their interests and passions not only helps them explore ways to engage with the world and develop fundamental skills for living in our literate and numerate society, it also helps them cultivate a substantial level of self-awareness that will serve them well as adults. Things like the environments in which they more effectively create and learn. Day job, night shift, regular supervision, entrepreneurial, and the fields they find engaging. Health, animals, computers, art, food, construction. At this point, I was less worried about the idea of missing out because that only has meaning if we're caught in that 18-year window. With our lifelong perspective, our children can do and learn things at any time they choose. Just because it may take me longer to get a black belt when I'm older because my body is less flexible and strong doesn't mean it's not worth that extra effort now that it's something I'm interested in or learning an instrument or a language. When children choose what they do with their time, it's never time wasted. Unschooled children haven't missed out. They know different things than their schooled peers, not less. Another interesting aspect of passionate interests is the idea that each person has a passion that they are born with and that they need to discover and cultivate so that they can have a happy life. Find your life's passion is a common battle cry in self-help circles. I prefer to think of it as find something you are passionate about. <clears throat> I don't see interests and passions as something already inside a person. Rather, I think there's a base personality, a base of personality and character traits that lend themselves to developing certain interests, passions, and careers. Like a night owl who thrives on adrenaline being more suited to a career as an ER doctor. But I don't think there are one or two passions buried in a person's DNA waiting to be unearthed. 
I also don't think having a talent for something makes you obligated to be passionate about it. Those are two separate things, though, of course, they can go hand in hand. A passion isn't so much discovered as it is developed. You find something interesting and you try it out. You gain some experience. You find you like it and want to do it more. You gain more experience. At some point, as you cycle deeper and deeper, you notice you've become passionately interested in it. Does it sustain? Maybe, maybe not. When I was growing up, my passion was ballet, many hours a week for at least a dozen years. Then I threw myself into university life. Then during my paid work career, my passion was all about understanding the business systems of running a nuclear power plant which eventually narrowed even further into analyzing data to give solid information for decision-making. I really enjoyed it. Then my passion was parenting. Now, as my active parenting role wanes, my passion for writing has been blossoming. There are common threads that run through all these passions, which is the premise of Pamela Slim's book, Body of Work, Finding the Thread that Ties Your Story Together. I don't think those specific passions were all encoded inside of me waiting to be discovered. I found them through making choices that aligned with my interests, goals, needs, and personality. And they evolved and changed over time, just as I did, as I do. And the same goes for our children. As they explore their interests and passions, and as their self-awareness grows, they too will discover the threads that weave through their choices. The wonderful thing about starting this process in childhood is that they'll have less conventional baggage to overcome, and as they approach adulthood, they'll have a better understanding of themselves and already be experienced with making choices that align with their strengths and goals. All great things. The value of lifelong learning. Looking at learning as the work of childhood does everyone a profound disservice. When we believe that there is a fixed set of knowledge to teach children within a fixed number of years, an arbitrary timeline of learning is born that holds little value in the real world. For example, right now in Ontario, Canada, students in grade six, as part of the science and technology program, in the fundamental concepts thread of structure and function, learn about flight. The big ideas, their wording, to be conveyed to students in this unit are that Flight occurs when the characteristics of structures take advantage of certain properties of air. And that air has many properties that can be used for flight and other purposes. Students are introduced to the basic forces involved in flight, lift, weight, thrust, and drag, their relationships to each other, and the ways they are controlled by planes. They discuss the compressibility and insulating qualities of air, and the characteristics of living things that enable them to fly. Is there a reason that these facts about air and flight need to be learned at age 11 or 12, depending on their birthday? (laughs) From the learner's perspective, none at all. Outside of school, what might learning about flight and the properties of air look like? Conversations about compressed air may be sparked when getting balloons filled at the party store or when filling their bike tire at the local garage or when using a hand pump to fill an air mattress. They'll notice the insulating qualities of air when they use a sleeping bag or a winter coat and maybe wonder aloud how they work. How birds fly, the similarities between birds and planes, the power of jet engines, and the unique flight characteristics of bats and hummingbirds will likely come up naturally in conversations over the years. If we don't know the answer to our children's questions, we can look up the answer and learn alongside them. Or if the kids are a bit older, they'll probably look up the answers themselves. There's a good chance that children will make paper airplanes and fly a kite at some point, watch an air show one summer, or maybe take a flight to visit relatives or for a family vacation. A few children might become enthralled with flight and planes, hanging out at airports to watch them take off and land, playing flight simulators, watching documentaries on their history and manufacture, maybe even taking flying lessons themselves. Others might take their first flight at the age of 23 and find their curiosity kindled at that moment, setting off a deeper investigation into the technical details of flight. And if they never develop an interest in or encounter a need to learn about flight, that's okay too. Their life is full of what they value. 
The classroom is about simulating real life. Unschooling is about living it. The goal of the education system is to teach children the knowledge and skills the curricular developers think are needed to be successful in the adult world. Yet woven into the system are messages about learning that in the long term actually discourage it. Things like learning is often hard and boring, meaning avoid it when possible. Learning is a passive activity where someone else hands you knowledge, meaning you can't learn things on your own, you need a teacher. Others know better what you should be learning, meaning your personal curiosity and questions aren't important. And when you graduate from school, you'll know what you need to be a successful adult, meaning you're done learning, phew. <laughs> and along the way, the words learning and schooling become synonymous. But without the conventional wisdom that childhood is for learning and adulthood is for living, unschooling children see learning as something they do naturally as part of living. It's woven so completely into their days. Why would they ever stop? There's no vacation from unschooling. The messages children absorb through living an unschooling lifestyle are much more in alignment with how learning inherently works. So learning is often interesting and enjoyable, meaning you dive in when you find something you want to know. Learning is an active endeavor where you seek to understand something, meaning you learn how to learn things. You choose what you want to learn, meaning your interests and questions are important. And learning is an integral part of living, meaning learning never stops. It's a lifelong activity. Unschooling parents see this in action every day. Learning is part of our human makeup. It's the compulsory and standardized nature, both content and process, of learning in the education system that many children actively resist not the learning itself. And why is a lifelong learning view of learning even more important today? Well, John Holt nails it in his book, How Children Fail. He writes, since we can't know what knowledge will be most needed in the future, it is senseless to try to teach it in advance. Instead, we should try to turn out people who love learning so much and learn so well that they will be able to learn whatever needs to be learned. That was true when he originally wrote it in 1964, and with the ever-increasing pace of change in our world, it's more true now than ever. The concept of lifelong learning has been showing up more frequently in public conversation for this reason, yet because a society has come to equate school and learning, many of the solutions continue to look like school. Adult continuing education classes are proliferating. Interestingly, there's a growing world of learning online. People with in-depth knowledge about niche topics can now reach more than a handful of others interested in learning what they know. These online entrepreneurs are creating communities around their interests and passions with a mix of free and paid content that focuses on the needs of their customers, learners. They are creating a wide range of written audio and video content that accommodates the various learning styles because their audience is asked. People are free to go through the information and learn at their own pace. And the process does not include testing because the learning is for the learner's benefit. They don't need to prove it to anyone else. I explored and learned about the business of writing and publishing through free content on websites and blogs for years before venturing into paid courses for advanced and detailed information from more experienced people in the industry. Those years of exploration helped me to figure out whose knowledge was worth paying for, for me, and the online courses I've taken have been very valuable. For others seeking to learn about writing and publishing, other courses might be better suited. That's because we may be starting at different places with a different set of existing knowledge. We may have different goals, different learning styles, respond better to different personalities, and so on. When we are free to choose what we want to learn and how we want to learn it, learning thrives. When curriculum defines the content of learning, children internalize a message that learning is boring and hard. When the school system defines the process of learning as teaching and testing, the system ends up relying on extrinsic motivation, which in turn effectively turns learning into short-term memorization of what's on the next test. When the classroom environment determines the pace of learning and doesn't feel emotionally safe, students don't get to regularly sink into the flow of learning and experience the joy of full engagement in an activity. 
Learning looks so different outside of the school box. When all learning is considered relevant and children learn things as they encounter them in the ways that work for them, they discover that learning is engaging and fun and sometimes challenging. Yet often they choose to persevere even through those challenging moments because they are intrinsically motivated to reach their goal. Either way, learning happens. Without an external and arbitrary timetable to follow and in the safety and comfort of their family, they are free to sink into the flow of their activities, diving as deeply as they want for as long as they are interested, skirting the edge of their skills where solid learning happens. Even though it defies much of the conventional wisdom about children and learning, so many unschooling parents have discovered that children experience the joy of learning when they are free to learn with the full and loving support of their parents. Learning is an integral part of living, as natural as breathing, and will always be part of their lives. I hope you found this episode helpful on your unschooling journey. And be sure to check out the growing podcast archive. The conversations never go out of date. You can find more information about my books, the Living Joyfully Network online community, and the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit online course at my website, livingjoyfully.ca.